Okay, so in this video I want to talk fairly informally about topology and just introduce a few of the ideas so we can start to get used to them. Uh, I'm going to use a lot of terminology that I'm not really going to formalise, we'll eventually come back to later, but for now I'm just going to rely on examples and intuition. So, essentially the goal of topology is to, first of all, define what we mean by a topological space, and then to classify these topological spaces according to what topological invariants they share. So I used a lot of terminology in that sentence, let's pick apart what some of it means. So first of all we need to define or understand what we mean by a topological space. So essentially a topological space could be any kind of abstract object. We usually like to think about it as a set of points that would correspond to some geometrical object, say. But essentially we need to be able to realise this abstract entity as a set. So now it can't just be any set, it has to be a particular type of set or a set that carries a certain structure known as a topology. Uh, I'll define this concretely in a future video, but for now I just want to say that a topology... Essentially all the topology does is it allows us to define or understand what we mean by an open subset of the set that we're considering. So that would be uh, the definition of a topology as a set. Now let's see some examples of objects which are topological spaces. So something like the circle, which is called S1. Something like the sphere, which is S2. And then something like the torus, T2. So I have some examples of topological spaces here. This would be a torus. Could have something more complex, like some polyhedra of any dimension. Something a bit more exotic, like a Mobius strip. or even something which can't exist in three dimensions, something like a Klein bottle. So all of these objects we can realise as being topological spaces, and now what we want to do is come up with a way to talk about these topological spaces or their topological properties. So this is what we mean by a topological invariant. So essentially, a topological invariant is potentially any kind of property that we could define on a topological space. It could be something like its dimension or the number of holes that it has. But the key point is, is that given two topological spaces, we should be able to look at their invariants and then conclude whether or not we can smoothly or continuously deform one into the other. So I'll just say now a topological invariant is uh, any property of the space. And now the way that we use these properties to classify spaces is that we say spaces that don't have the same topological invariants. So spaces that differ on any of their topological invariants cannot be the same. What do we mean by the same? Well, essentially we mean that we can smoothly deform one of the spaces into another. So let's see an example of this. I've already mentioned the circle. Well, you can quite easily understand the circle is going to be equivalent to any kind of one-dimensional closed loop, or even something with corners, like the square. All of these spaces are, at least through the eyes of topology, considered to be equivalent, and the technical name for that is homeomorphic. So the same 
is meaning homeomorphic. And all that means is that we can continuously deform one into the other. So if we just imagine our topological space as the circle being made out of this ideal rubber that we can stretch and move around, we can see how we can easily create any of these shapes from the circle. And now I should mention that when we're doing these deformations, we're never allowed to cut the space and then glue it back together. We have to keep all of the points next to each other or deform the space in a continuous way. And now you'll notice here that this space has corners. We might worry about whether we can smoothly deform this space into a corner. While smooth implies differentiable, in fact, we don't need to do this in a differentiable way. We only need to do it in a continuous way. So it's clear the square is obviously still continuous. It has these corners, but that's fine because we don't need things to be smooth or differentiable at this point yet. So I've mentioned the word geometry previously. We would see these figures which I've drawn are obviously inequivalent geometrically. This is round, this is wiggly, this is square. However, they are equivalent through the eyes of topology since there is no way to distinguish between these spaces by considering their topological invariance. They are the same. Now, we might think that, OK, well, these topological invariants are great. We can just look at two topological spaces, compare them with their invariants, and then decide whether or not they're going to be homeomorphic. Well, unfortunately, this isn't the case, because there could potentially be an infinite number of possible invariants that we could define. Some could be unknown to us. We could have, have two topological spaces that match on all of their invariants, but we're just not, not counting one that we've missed or haven't understood yet. All that we can do by comparing invariants is to conclude whether or not two spaces are not homeomorphic. So that might seem fairly disappointing. It actually turns out to be much more useful, since we can easily decide whether or not two spaces are not going to be homeomorphic. To prove that they are homeomorphic, we simply just need to construct a concrete way to deform one into the other, but sometimes it can be harder to see how you would not be able to do that. So just as an easy example, the sphere and the torus can be easily seen to be not homeomorphic because the sphere has no holes, the torus has one hole. In order to deform a sphere into a torus, we would have to cut it or punch a hole in it in some way. So just to reiterate then, topological invariants can only lead you to, to conclude whether or not two spaces are not homeomorphic. So I'll just give you a few examples now of some possible topological invariants. A simple one would be the dimension of the space. So the circle would be a, a one-dimensional space, the sphere two-dimensional, etc. Another invariant would be the genus which is essentially just the number of holes. So the sphere, although it might feel like it has a hole, what we mean by the sphere, or rather the circle, sorry, is simply only the points that lie on the circle. There's nothing else. So it doesn't have a hole through it because it's just this continuous line, essentially. The surface of the sphere, again, S2, clearly has no holes. However, the torus does have a hole, one hole. We could even then construct a torus with more holes, as many as we like. Because this has two holes, it cannot be homeomorphic to the torus with one hole. So the number of holes is a good way to classify spaces which are distinct. And now we can see that the circle is not homeomorphic to the sphere because they have different dimension. And then, as we mentioned before, the sphere is not homeomorphic to the torus because they have a different genus. Okay, so now we have a little bit of an idea about what we mean by a topological space. And I mentioned before that a topological space should be able to be realised as a set. So how do we realise spaces as a set? 
Well, let's consider a simple example, the circle, S1. We might usually realise this as being the set of all points X and Y, say, in the plane, such that X squared plus Y squared is equal to 1. It's a fairly standard notion, it's just giving us this set of points here as a subset of R2. Now that's perfectly valid and perfectly fine, however it relies on this extra structure of R2 that we don't want to define. In fact this would be an example of a topological space that's been embedded into a higher dimensional space. The circle is obviously one dimensional, embedded into a two dimensional plane, we want to just come up with a, a more intrinsic one-dimensional description of the circle. So an obvious choice or an obvious way to do this would be to consider um, the angular coordinate. So essentially this angular coordinate, if we like, well I should move away from this figure because we want to talk about the circle free of a higher dimensional space. So the angular coordinate, if we imagine we're starting with a round circle now for simplicity, the angular coordinate, which would be phi, or theta actually, measured from some zero point, which is still arbitrary, this theta effectively splits up the circle or gives a unique number or characterization to every point on the circle. So we might think, well, we can just talk about all the points on the circle is just coming from this interval, theta runs from naught to 2 pi. That gives us a way to uniquely talk about every single point on the circle, and it doesn't rely on any higher two-dimensional structure, it's intrinsically one-dimensional, we just have one variable. However, we have to be careful now because we should realise that the points 0 and 2 pi, if you go all the way around the circle, you arrive back at this point. So the points 0 and 2 pi should in some way be the same point. So how would we go about constructing this now? Well, we use a so-called equivalence relation. So I'm not going to want to give you the, the full details of this, but it should be fairly intuitively clear. Essentially, we define the circle S1 as being the set of all points theta coming from the real numbers. And we define this theta in such a way that theta is, and now I use a new symbol, equivalent to, which means the equivalence relation, the point theta is equivalent to theta plus 2 pi. Essentially all this means is that if you take some angle, the angle is describing the same point on the circle as if you go around by 2 pi. So a neat way to visualize this is in the following way. So we've seen that theta comes from this closed interval. Well now we should realize that it's an interval but with the end point zero, the end point is the same as the 2 pi point. So if we imagine now we're some one dimensional creature that lives on this circle, we can travel along the circle when we reach 2 pi, we just instantly return back to the zero point because all we've done is started somewhere, got all the way around the circle and reach back to the same point. So we now have a complete intrinsic one-dimensional characterization of this topological space as a set. It's just this set of points on this interval with the end points identified as being the same point. And this is constructly or this is concretely constructed using this equivalence relation on the real numbers which essentially just says every point is equivalent to that point 
added to pi. So now I did this for the round circle, it would be equivalent for any kind of circle. We would just have to be a bit more clever in the way we construct our theta coordinate, but essentially we would still be able to use a one-dimensional coordinate to characterize all of the points on the circle, so long as we abide by the rule that when you've gone all the way around, you're at the same point. Okay, so that was the circle, that was a fairly simple topological space. We can construct some more complicated topological spaces by using the Cartesian product, which I defined in the preliminaries video.